I, for, I break myself up. My first guest is... Uh, but, well, there are people in the movies who are stars, and uh, they aren't always good actresses, and there are people who are actresses who aren't necessarily stars. My next guest is lucky because she is an actress and uh, a star. A rare combination, but one that we're lucky about, too. She's mesmerized generation of moviegoers. She's playing Julie, whether it's Julie Marston and Jezebel or Margot Channing and All About Eve or Dark Victory or um, I, I, made, I made I took a list of her films at random and just ran down them. Uh, Human Bondage, Dangerous, Fog Over Frisco, Border Town, The Petrified Forest, The Little Foxes, The Letter, The Old Maid, Now Voyager, Payment on Demand, All About Eve, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, and Cabin in the Cotton. <laughs> I must ask her about that. Will you welcome, please, the great Miss Betty Davis. sang a song once it was on the hit parade which was that that either too young or too old that was in the days of a lucky strike hit parade oh, and it was yeah. number one for weeks i was never so flattered in my life that it was my song and i begged them to let me sing it on it but uh, for many uh, practical reasons well they couldn't because then everybody was saying a song to want to go in the hit parade you see so wait you're betty davis the singer i've done lots of singing i i, I asked for betty davis you know, the actress you know I've, done lo I've done lots of singing you have done singing. I've done a great deal of singing in a very mm -hmm. odd way, I sing. But I've done lots of singing. I actually did a review of a musical here in New York. Yeah. And you, you, made a, you sang in a couple of films. Oh, I've sung many songs. Yeah. An ambition of mine, really, is to um, do, a, do an album of, of all the songs with, with sort of comments between Mr. Crosby, who I'm not comparing myself to singing-wise, I might add. But it would be interesting, because <laughs> I have sung many songs. Yeah. I, I, had I been brought up in this generation of uh, theater, uh, I, I would have learned to do musical comedy as, as an adjunct, because nowadays you've got to be able to sure. do both, as you know. Matter of fact, musicals more than anything else. There are really. more people in musicals than in other things. <laughs> how, how big a range do you have? Do you have any idea? Well, I'm about deep bass. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. No, I haven't a lot of range. It has sort of more personality than vocal ability, shall we say. I, I, well, you say that. I like the way, I like the way you're attired. Um, you do? I, yeah, I never know. What is a, a lady go through when she decides to come on? Did you have a debate with yourself as to whether to wear that or something more? Yes, you do. You do rather consider it. Was um, it a toss-up between this and hot pants? Well, uh, <laughs> well uh, you see, I am so uh, sick of pants on women that I can't tell you. I, I think that all the men should go into kilts. Just as an answer. To get even. And you know, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it happened that men started wearing skirts. You wouldn't. No, but really, but you know, the pants is, uh, has served a purpose because nobody knows what length to wear the dress now. Uh, really, well, I've heard many women say this, so mm -hmm. they've gotten by the new fashion uh, with, with, with the trousers. But I'm very tired of them, except for home and the beach mm -hmm. and all that. I think in evening, in the evening, skirts are rather feminine. Yeah. And as regards hot pants, the name of it makes me sick. <laughs> <laughs> if they, uh, no, I think it's, if they it's, a very, them... it's a very sort of personal expression. You say, I've got hot pants for you. Well, you know, th <laughs> this is what it means. Well, no. This is what it means. No. That was, M well, Davis maybe is... it was just my generation, but in our generation, if you said, I've got hot pants for you, it meant that just one thing. <laughs> and I think it's very vulgar calling a piece of clothing hot pants. What if they called them uh, brief shorts? Would that? Well, would I think if that? they called them mini shorts, anything. Yeah. But hot pants. You're I think right. It's it does vulgar. have a connotation. But then, of course, I'm a Yankee and very prudish, as you know, lived a very prudish life. Is that so? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I'm you know, really very you know. serious. I think it's a. I think it's a. Well, as far as wearing them is concerned, they're marvelous for kids. Yeah. All these fashions are marvelous for kids. So as going back to what you first said about what mm -hmm. you, you do consider, it's a daytime show, you wear sort of something like this. Yeah. If you come on for New Year's Eve, like I did before with you once, um, it was something gayer. Yeah. You know? Yeah. This is seen at night, so that, that makes it very difficult when you're yes, taking the Yes, I'm not supposed to mention that, am I? Well, you can cut it. Well, it's, no, that's... <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, can I? We... I forgot. I forgot. I'm very sorry. Now, I know you play independent women, but I'll give you a glass of water. Will you? Yes, you don't need to do that yourself. No, I, I... Say, you're talking about being crudish. Do you remember the talk show one time where Tom Smothers asked you if you fool around? No, oh, mess around. Oh, was it he mess said, around? would you mess around a little? And I fell on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, Which is never a sort be of so... answer, well, actually. Never be so... <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I hope they You're got... too sharp today. I'm sorry. Let, too sharp this evening. Let us attack that from another direction. No, but I was very, very proud. I was very proud as an older woman that he would say that to me. You can't imagine. It set me up for days. I don't remember you. <laughs> there you go. I'll catch you up with you in a moment. But first, oh, uh, it's always an honor to have a great lady of the theater here and then go into a kitty litter commercial. But here is John Baker, <laughs> world-renowned cat breeder and his prize Burmese Ferdinand. <laughs> We're the word, <laughs> we're the word about new litter green. Talking with Betty Davis. When people ask you about people that you made films with, who, who do they most want to know about? I, my guess now would be Bogey. Uh, you and Humphrey Bogart made your first film together, and uh... oh, yes, the first film at Universal called Bad Sister. Yes, both. Yeah. Of it. I don't. I don't. I think it was his first film too. I think it was. Yeah, I think actually, appalling, appalling film. Was it? He was the city slicker. Yeah. And it was just. It was, the script was just like that. The city slicker. Um, I was the good sister. You? Yes. Oh, yes. Well, I, I really, that's, that's, is, a, that what? is my image, basically. I only play parts of other people. Yeah. Now I'm old and the evil has come out a little more. <laughs> <laughs> but at that time, no, that was, that was, uh, it was very amazing that I went into that other area. And I only went into that other area because those were the good acting parts. And just mm -hmm. playing heroines, uh, it was never very fascinating to me. You know, I always was basically a character uh, actress from the beginning. It would be a waste, I would think, to have you well, too many good sisters. It was just boring, and also this, I so. didn't like myself very well. So if you play just a, a, a heroine, there's nothing to mm -hmm. hide behind, you see? And uh, there's no question about it in my mind at this point that uh, actors are people who are not very fond of themselves, therefore they love being other people. I'm convinced of this. For years I couldn't decide. This must be the basic drive that we want to get away from ourselves. And when you play a heroine, you can't get away from yourself. It must just you be must yourself. Be, yeah. And that's the hardest thing to play. When really. did you realize that? How, how long did it take for that to sink in? Did you deny it for years? That, that... No, no, I didn't deny the doing of it. But mm -hmm. I always uh, thought about it a lot and wondered if that were the truth. And, and I'm convinced that is the truth. Mm -hmm. But you're such a marvelous... Deceit becomes you in the movies. Um, the, the, uh... Glad to be added in the movies. Because I'm a very undeceitful person, you see. No, truthfully. In life. I'm, oh, this is one of my tragedies. I'm far too honest. I should have learned years ago, sort of, be half honest. Mm -hmm. You know. Did you ever get to a point in your career where you thought you were kind of, you were often a rebel and fought with the studios and fought with people that you're not supposed to fight with and, and, uh... You know, that word fight is a... I've thought about that a lot and it's given me mm -hmm. a terrible reputation, just that word. It really isn't fighting. It's really a deep determination. Uh, to have it the way you believe it should be. And that is legitimate in, in a career or in business or, or, or in anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, you must have discussions, for instance, people with, uh, over you on this show of what you believe this show should be. That's not really a fight. It's a bad word. It's just a conviction. And, mm -hmm. and nothing is going to stop you from, from, from winning this conviction. But you're driven to the point, finally, where you have to fight it because nobody Well, sometimes it, ends up, it ends up in rather a brawl, yes. Yeah. But, yeah. but it isn't basically that you want to fight because I'm not a person who really loves to fight. I think it takes a lot out of you, as a matter of fact. Yeah, the energy is building. Easy, it's your... much easier to say, yes, I'll do what you say. Mm -hmm. Much mm -hmm. easier. Anybody ever take you aside and say, you better be careful, uh, you, sure, you can't argue with people like Jack Warner and all these big people? I look back on it now and I wonder. I must have had a lot of courage as a very young person mm -hmm. because it, it wasn't easy to go into Mr. Jack Warner. Yeah. To, to try and win a point about a script or, or whatever. I was to be scared to death, matter of fact. Yeah. Then, then, then you, you, you... Success helps you. Uh, eventually, if you become gradually more successful, then, then, then you have more security going into your boss. But in the very be I started out in the very beginning to have convictions about what I should do, you know? Mm -hmm. Like cheesecake, for instance. I never did cheesecake. And this, in those days, was an enormous argument not to get into bathing suits and and all that kind of photography. And I always said, if I get anywhere, I don't want those pictures of me around. And there's not a nude of me anywhere. Nowhere? 
You've never been nude? Well, of course, in that day, can you imagine nude pictures, my lord? There was no such thing. They couldn't. Oh, no such thing. Imagine. Oh, no, we were at yeah. a Kellerman suit, you know, although we were all covered up. There weren't bikinis or anything. But even that I didn't like, because I thought that had nothing to do with acting, and I thought it was cheap. You, you said that your actors don't like themselves, and that's why they're going to acting. Uh, did you find that you also did not like your appearance? You often said they didn't. You said they shouldn't cast you in certain ways because oh, you I looked never wrong could bear to look at myself. No one can. I, it's hard to believe that. No, it's never just could hard bear. To it. It. Never could bear it. And when I think of how I look now and how I looked then, I was a perfect fool. I looked just great. <laughs> <laughs> earth I was complaining about. I just I see, one, see Jezebel or Victory. And I just look at that gorgeous looking thing and, I, and then I look in the mirror and I say, and you beefed about it. No, okay, directors well, kept me out of rushes. Oh, they wouldn't let me go. I'd be upset for days. Because it drove you berserk to look at I just couldn't stand my face yeah. ever. No. Gee. No, never. Well? Still can't. Well, I can stand it then. <laughs> I liked it then and I like it now. Well, thank you, Richard. Very okay. Much. Thank you very much. We have a message by local stations. We'll be right back. <laughs> Miss Davis, what does it mean that you went to England to try to break your contract with, um, with Warner Brothers? Well, I've never I, understood that. Well, um, I, I left Warner's because of scripts. Mm -hmm. I, I realized after two or three years of housewife and Bureau of Missing Persons and Parachute Jumper and a few little dillies like that, that nothing much was going to happen with my career. And so I just decided I, if I was, I believe in life, if you're going to beef about something, do something about it. So I said, if you're beefing and unhappy, go. And my last meeting with, with Jack Warner was quite marvelous because he sent for me. He said, please don't leave. We've just optioned a marvelous new book. And of course, at that point. You'd heard that before. I'd heard that before. He said, just, we've just optioned a marvelous new book called Gone with the Wind for You. I said, I'll bet it's a dilly. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> And I came back and a year later, and I found out it was a dilly the other way. They made a movie no, of so that, So I went to they? England. I signed a... <laughs> they made a movie of that. Yes. Right. So I signed a contract with a, a Europe... with a, a man in England for a film mm -hmm. to really to precipitate what would happen with Warners. And, of course, he injuncted me, and we went into the English courts. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was basically a legal argument, uh, because, you see, whatever you refused to do under those contracts, they could add on to your time until the film was finished. So you could have a five-year contract that would last a lifetime, unless you did everything they told you to do. So that's what this was all about. So that Warner Brothers did away with their suspension clause and gave me a final ending to my contract, no matter what happened. But of course, when we got back to America, that was English law. And Olivia de Havilland won this case in America. She was kept on suspension for a year, I believe. And she went to court, and she is the one we can all thank for the seven-year contract. But it was basically my same trial. What films, when you do see them, speaking of Gone with the Wind, do you wish you'd been in? I was absolutely dying to do uh, Anna in, 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 uh, with Rex Harrison, not in the musical version, but the one they made first. They made it first, you know. As a drama. As a drama. Yeah. I was dying to play that part. Um, what keeps you from getting it, then? I was under contract, and they would not loan me out. Same thing. They only loaned me out twice, once for bondage and once for foxes. Don't you feel like... In those 18 years. feel like a, 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 a cattle or something. You know, I also had around. a vague chance that it happened one night. That disappointed me terribly. Yeah. Because I was always, every now and then, wanting some kind of lighter kind of thing for variety, because I always believed in variety. You mustn't mm -hmm. get into the same niche and just keep going. I never asked a, a film star this, but... Um, if your private life is going well, does it necessarily mean you'll work well, or can it work the other way, that if it's going badly for some reason, your work will get better? I've never you know had what? the question asked. You know what I'm asking? Is there any correspondence between how your private life is going? Well, let's just say, it is far easier to go to work at six in the morning if your private life is charming. Uh, it's far easier to come home. Many businessmen know this. We've read all these articles about this, coming home to the wife and the dishwasher and the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And they're very, very tired. And if you come home at night and you have a charming, pleasant home, after a very hard day, which I'm sure you know, uh, you aren't nearly as exhausted. Mm -hmm. But I have a lovely story. One of the greatest tragedies of my life uh, had happened just before a dark victory which I peddled at Warner's for years to get them to do, and they finally, Mr. Warner finally said, well, nobody will ever go and see this, because who wants to see a woman who dies? 
but you love to act have a ball. That was the way he sent me off. So I was proud to say it made a little money. But anyway, uh, I was in a terrible state, terrible state. So, and Mr. Wallace was executive then, and so I went up to him after a week, and I said, Mr. Wallace, you have to recast me. I wanted to play this part for years. I am ruining it. I am a complete wreck, and of course, did not tell anybody why. And he just said, stay sick. <laughs> in other words, the first week's work was just fine. Yeah, and interestingly yeah. enough, uh, in that particular film, because of, of, of her glioma and her illness, we did all the scenes first in the doctor's office. There was an added thing in me that, mm -hmm. that, I, that I think added to the performance. No question That's about that. Mm -hmm. Of course, he's right that no one would do it. No, you, no, I think it's so much easier a happy, yeah. a happy home for professional people because we really do work under great nervous strain, you know? Yeah, the strain in the one place is enough. Yes. But he's right. No one would go see a movie about a woman dying. Love Story is bombing no. all over oh, the I place. Oh, I know. Love Story is bombing all over the place. Absolutely. <laughs> Hasn't sold a ticket. Well, but you, this was a long time ago. Yeah. They, yeah. they did not have that many. Because uh, I never felt Doc Richter was an unhappy ending. I felt it was, a, it was courage for people who had to face something like this, uh, which I think it, it is. Uh, but they didn't make films like You know, these were revolutionary kinds of stories for that day. This is a long time ago. 71 what in the 40s mm -hmm. so that was an unusual script for that day you may take this as a compliment or not I don't know but I what I'm what I think is so great about you is that uh, you were more interesting many times than the character you played or the picture you were in and we got to know you you're the interesting thing you're so damn much more interesting than the some of the women that you've played because the scripts were not great or whatever yes yeah, so many uh, of those that, that, well, that, that's, that's a nice... That, that must well, no, be there are many a... scripts that aren't. And, and, of course, then the actor is put upon to, to try and make the character at least somebody the audience will be interested in. And that's the toughest kind of film to make in the world. The easiest kind of film to make in the world, of course, is when, when the characters are written beautifully. Like, you know, you can use the example of All About Eve. That's one of the great scripts ever written in the world. All, sure. of, all any of us had to do was just come to work love every minute of it and do and say what mr mankowitz wrote that's mm -hmm. that's heaven that happens about once about four times in your entire life in, in the theater really what else do you, you look know? forward to is, is, the leading man would make it important too and who, who you're working with obviously who are the best screen lovers i can't think of anybody well I you know really i didn't work with any of the, i didn't work with any of the great uh, i made a note of that i wrote the great screen so I gable didn't, or grant you didn't make uh, no you moment. see because in those days if, if you had any kind of box office you, you had to carry the film alone. For yeah. instance, I never really made a picture with Bogey. He was in Dark Victory with me very briefly as the, before he became a star. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always, there was a marvelous uh, story called The Prize Fighter and the Lady, a marvelous play that I begged Warners to let Bogey and me make. Well, they, they, they wouldn't put us together. That was a waste. They could get two pictures, you know, instead of one. Cagney, for instance, always wanted to do a really serious film with we made a hideous thing called the bride came cod which you know what was the name of it the bride came cod where he took cactus out of my fanny you know one of those comedies <laughs> well warners had said warners, warners had said for years and years you've got to do a comedy i finally said all right you're sick of my doing tragedy that's what i meant to do but any comedy you give me so that's the one I got. They never asked me again. No more there's no point. Well, there's no point to it. It was just mm -hmm. a perfectly ghastly film. So I never really, truly worked with Jimmy either. Yeah. The one I wanted to work with the most was Charles Lawton. Oh, how I wanted to have two of the meanest characters in the world written in play. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, ad I adored him. But yeah. I never worked with any of the great lovers. Boyer, of course, I worked with who, who was a pretty smashing... Mm -hmm. guy in the love area i would say from the standpoint of the audiences and that was a thrill and howard of course was worshipped by women leslie uh, but none of our so-called great screen lovers did i work with and i worked with spencer in, in, in one of our very first films before he ever, even went to metro where i had a little bit in, in twenty thousand years in sing sing but this was so so many years ago that would have been a thrill to have done one with him yeah, yeah. what's the film you would least like to see on the late show if you see it on when you switch it off immediately what's your biggest oh, bomb there's so Davis? many <laughs> <laughs> well there's one i would hate to ever see on the on the late show uh, which was uh, again was beyond the forest that's what that's <laughs> what's a dump that's what that was it <laughs> <laughs> was what a dump in beyond the forest of all the things that, that 
film is made famous. This hideous film is made famous by Mr. Edward Albee with What a Dump, you know. Yeah. Uh, that, that, I hope, never appears. I wouldn't like to see Parachute Jumper again. Uh, I wouldn't like to see In This Hour Life, because that was a heartbreak. It was Ellen Glasgow's great, great book, and it was without doubt one of the worst films ever made in the history of the world. Cabin in the Cotton. Uh, now, I've got to tell you about this. Cabin in the Cotton has my favorite line in it that I ever spoke in my life. And this is it. I'd love to kiss you, but I just washed my hair. Yeah. <laughs> That's my favorite. That's <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of washing, yes. here is a message about clean wash for you. you Cleaner you? water for everyone. I've, I've used that on here. Have you? On your hair? Looking for a job, and I couldn't resist. The staff brushed him up a bit, and here he is. Will you welcome Artie Johnson? <laughs> told me you were shy and uninhibited. I am, essentially. <laughs> was, you can yes. see that, yes, of uh, course. Yes. Oh, wait a minute. A man for, with your success on Laugh-In suddenly out of work? Yes, Is I'm, I'm unemployed. No, I'm unemployed. Unemployed? I'm unemployed. Isn't am... anyone helping you? Uh, can, can you uh, take dictation? We're looking for... Uh... Yes. No, strangely enough, I have somebody that's helping me. Somebody that, um, that in fact, he reminded me that uh, you made some statement in Bullets Durgum, the great legend. There's is, no bullets, there is, there is a bullet circum, and he told me a story about you that I thought was fascinating, yeah. where you told about the time when you were in Hollywood, and you used to watch bullets driving up and back down the street in his Jaguar. Yes, I and, wondered why and, did that. Well, he told me that you walked up to him and asked him one of your great ambitions was to be able to ride with him in that Jaguar. And I thought if that was an ambition, you were in such trouble. <laughs> Yeah. I did. I used to see this man with his curious... Do you know who Bullet Sturgum is? But no, he's no. A, he, used to, he was Jackie Gleason's... Uh, he was Jackie Gleason's agent manager, 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 manager for a long time. Yeah. I used to see him riding, and I, used to, and I always wanted to get into the car. Yes. I was a curious child. Yes, I imagine. I could see you jumping from car to car. <laughs> You're weird. Miss Davis, would you like a gentleman to light that for you? Oh, I, no, it's this is, no, this is quite all right. Don't be that independent. <laughs> but it's, yes, it's sir. not often that a man gets to light Betty Davis's... <laughs> Oh, I'm going to save this match. <laughs> oh, this, oh, this goes next to some of my better mementos. You, what were you going to You really me? know how to treat a lady, don't you? Yes, I... Isn't he smashing? Oh, that was total charm. Why didn't we ever do a movie together? Well, let's do it. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, you name it, and we'll start it right now. Yeah. Dick, you can leave. You don't suggest... Uh, you, you don't... No, I, I, no, I insist on being in it or else staying. Oh, good. You don't act like any of the people that you do on Laugh-In, so I can't tell what part of your personality they come from. Is any of you German, for example? No, none of me is German. I am a Middle Westerner. I, uh, everything that I do is based on observation, nothing else, because I really have had no opportunity to live in that realm or to mix with people like that. Uh, I think that essentially the way I developed all of these things was riding the public conveyances of the city of Chicago. And I just listened to the people talk, and I, I watched them, and over the course of time, I just put these things together, and they are what they are. And that's essentially what I've been Where doing. Where do Walnettos work into this? Well, this was a joke of mine that I had for a long, long time, and it was uh, literally I had uh, Tyrone whose original name is not Tyrone. That's his theatrical name, by the way, the little old man. Yes, what's his His original name? name was Julius Andrews. Uh-huh. Uh, his friends uh -huh. called him Julie. You mean but, the man he's based on? Yes, uh, Julie Andrews is, was, was his name. We found, oh. out, uh, we found out he couldn't work in the business because he couldn't get his uh, union card because there was some other fellow named Julie Andrews. Oh, so, we had to, so we had to change his name, and it became Tyrone F. Horney. <laughs> How does one spell Hornai? You never see it written As, out. as a Hornai is normally spelled. Um, <laughs> the uh, actual the French pronunciation would be Hornay. Yes. H-O-R-N-E-I-G-H. -E Hornay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. But for American consumption, it became Hornai. Yes. Mm -hmm. Probably best that way. It's much better that way because yeah. we could get in. Go ahead. There are rumors that you... Uh, I, I'm going to... 
take your personality and turn it inside out now in a way that yes. it never has been before because I've never seen you reveal that you are uh, a numismatist on the, on the television we, before. You know, and, uh, um, I know you were caught it. Uh, yes, I've been caught at numismatism, numismatism several yes. times. No, I've collected coins for a rather lengthy period of time. It's among many of the things that I do with outside interest. I'm also a bibliophile. I am also a collector of porcelain and uh, my wife and I have quite an extensive collection of uh, cattle figurines, various kinds in porcelain, silver, things of that nature. I, I'm just an inveterate collector. I love things and just go out and collect them. What's the passion for coin collecting? I sometimes, see, I pass a coin shop and it looks fun. I'd like to get in there and handle well, the coins. A, is that what the fun is, handling a, the coins? No, you don't handle the coins. In handling the coins, you, in a sense, damage them. Uh, many of the coins that I have are like they're when you look at the intricacy of the design in them, you realize how much work went into making the original plate to design the coins. And some of them are, they're like little works of art in a strange, funny way. And uh, the unfortunate part of coin collecting is the fact that you, in many instances, can't keep them in your home because of the insurance rates. So it's quite exorbitant. Your little no, mine are all, my little friends are all hidden in a, in a box somewhere in a bank. Every once in a while I go over there and I open the box and I look into it and go, Hi, kids. You know, it's, uh, it's frustrating. It's a frustrating form of collection, I must say. It's very frustrating for a lot of people because of the fact that you, you can't exhibit these things because people have a tendency to want to touch them, mm -hmm. and that is not good for the coins. What's your top coin worth? Somewhere in the range of $4,000. The original purchase, but the original purchase price was much, much less than that. Today. I dare you to show it to me. <laughs> oh, you have that kind of a show. <laughs> um, no, I... Uh, the, Boy, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> This, this particular coin, um, uh, I can't carry it with me, Dick. It's a very small coin. It's a very tiny coin, and it's... Uh, what is it? It, it was a, a three-cent, what they call a three-cent nickel. Hey, I heard that you worked for a calendar company <coughs> one time. Is that a skeleton that's hidden no. in your closet? Oh, no. I, was, uh, <coughs> Did you write I used the... to write calendars. I was very oh. good on threes. No, I, you, I, I, you know, somebody turns to you and says, now, it's time for you to write a calendar. What do you do? I, I literally learned how to count. One, two, three, four. Saturday, <laughs> third. Friday, fourth. How funny can you get? I did what that for a period of time. What does the job mean? <clears throat> well, there's, there, are major cal there are major firms throughout this country that do make calendars. And there's <laughs> copy on the top of those calendars, you know, like uh, American Blood Sausage and Screw Manufacturing Corporation. <laughs> we'll put out a calendar. You're not smiling even. You're in uh, trouble in Nebraska. I'm, I'm taking this, Omaha away yes, from I'm, you. I was trying to and, remember uh, that title. I'd like yes, to use it sometime. Yeah, but you have all of these various things, and they say, you know, for better undertaking, see Zinks or something. Mm -hmm. And that was the copy that you would, you would append to the top of the calendar. And everybody had calendars so that was literally one of the first jobs I had and I was an abject failure because I just didn't know how I didn't couldn't get with it there was no emotion involved so I would think there wouldn't be no. I mean, you can only go so far yeah, probably, right? that was that was essentially it was a, it was a very strange time in my life frankly but I learned numbers I'm gonna get out of here where, where are you going right would you like a glass of water can I help you like I'm with you I, I'm what did I say <laughs> now you what did I say what you did I didn't say anything. I was talking about a calendar. No, I, I didn't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Come back. I'll tell you what I'll you did. I'll give you back the match. I didn't mean what I said. You know what it is? What? I told you, Miss Davis was once attacked by a giant calendar. <laughs> I, I am and we warned every guest but you not to say the word calendar I never out here. Why didn't you tell me that? How insensitive can you be? I really, you know, I'm going to, I don't know how. Uh, no, you say, ask me something clever. Okay, where were you or where was I during the earthquake? Where I was, at, I was home in a ten, in a, on the 10th floor of a high rise when the earthquake occurred. Yeah. And uh, I must say it's something that I hope is never repeated in my lifetime. It's not a good place to be at. Uh, it was unparalleled in fear. I was terrified, terrorized. Uh, my wife. Davis. I'm sorry for saying calendar. Oh, it's all right. Okay. All You've right. forgiven him. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Do you know that every time it seems that the Senate gets into a major squabble, uh, my next guest is uh, in the middle of it. He led the fight against the Hainsworth and Carswell nominations. He's battling the SST and yesterday participated in a triumph as floor manager uh, for the bill giving the vote to 18-year-olds. Uh, and uh, it seems like no one disagreed with him yesterday. It must be a rare sensation. The final Senate vote was 94-0. Would you welcome the junior senator from Indiana, Senator Birch Bayh. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> you want me to repeat that? <laughs> well, I don't, so, I don't. I'll, I'll tell them later. Good to see you. Good to see I've you. I've got to tell him. You said you brought your pitchfork, and I think that's terrific for a politician. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, so. It was barely your line, you know. It was mine. Yes, yes. your line. But, but that's another attribute of politicians. They know a good thing when they see it. Yes. <laughs> Is there any chance that the Constitution's going to be amended in time for the 18-year-olds to vote, the ones who are for all of them to, to vote in this next uh, big election? I think so. It's amazing how in the last, um, really the last year, there's been a change. Uh, I think we can amend that uh, before the 1972 election. I think the reason we can is that the 1970 Voting Rights Act, uh, even though the uh, Supreme Court cut it in half, mm -hmm. still has enabled 18-year-olds to vote for president and senator and congressman. Mm -hmm. And this has enabled uh, them to vote for the highest offices of the land, but inconsistently enough, they can't vote for the lower, uh, more local offices. And I think uh, the inconsistency, the injustice, and the cost involved in implementing this type of a dual system is going to make it possible for us to succeed at long last after a many years struggle. What's the argument against their voting, though? I've never heard a convincing one. We are asking the wrong person. But uh, I ask you to assume a role now and, and argue against yourself in the best tradition of um, the old Greeks who used to have to learn to argue against their own position. Well, the main argument is that young people just aren't qualified to vote. I yeah. don't buy that argument. I think anyone who's had the opportunity to be ex uh, to expose, be exposed to young people today can't help but be amazed not only at their uh, sensitivity to national problems, but their awareness of how we should go about solving them. Yeah, that is a dumb argument. Do the people who say that actually believe it, or is it they just don't want 18-year-olds to vote for other reasons? Well, uh, there may be other reasons. I think yeah. some people do believe this. Uh, and I think probably qualification is a relative thing. Uh, perhaps I'm more qualified to be a senator today than I was yesterday. Mm -hmm. But the injustice of uh, uh, the voting system that sends young men to Vietnam, where the cold statistics on the battlefield show that half of them who died in Vietnam weren't old enough to vote for the public official to send them there. It seems to me this is uh, not the type of democratic system we ought to be proud of. Good idea. Ms. mentioned okay. she thought that was the best argument. I think that is a good one. I'm not sure that there aren't equally good arguments. Uh, What's the, the fact that, for you? Uh, well, there are two other general areas. One is that I think they're qualified. Mm -hmm. uh, we turn so many young people off by not letting them participate at an earlier age. Um, we lose a good raw material, to use very inhumanistic terms. And also, there's a pragmatic argument. As we were holding hearings, uh, we couldn't get some of the most far-out militant uh, youth organizations, some of these groups that want to tear down and destroy the system, to come and say uh, that 18-year-olds uh, should be permitted to vote. And I asked myself why, and suddenly you realize that the main rallying cry that is being used toward young people is that there's no place for you in the system. And if the system mm -hmm. itself purges itself of this inequity and young people are given a piece of the action, they can work within the system, then this totally destroys the rationale of those who say you have to destroy it. And I think, I think all of us, young and old, ought to be encouraged and given uh, full reign to work within the system. I've been trying to do that for a number of years, so perhaps I'm a bit prejudiced in that direction. Yeah. We have a message, but I would talk to you about something irritating I saw yesterday when we come back. We have a message. We'll be right back. Talking to Senator Birch by from Indiana. Uh, what about how many of us are being snooped on now that don't suspect it, and what's the status of the snooping investigations. Snooping is such an easy word, isn't it? They're Pro spying on people, that's what it is. Probably all of us, uh, maybe Miss Davis excluded. Uh, uh, Why me? What did I do? <laughs> <laughs> well, and what did Miss Davis not do? Anybody that speaks on live television with a German accent now, you know. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> but no, we shouldn't laugh about uh, that because frankly, remind us why it's bad to have the have people. Uh, well, we under, we uncovered a on. document the other day, which uh, was a, an edict uh, put out by the army, in which they had been commissioned to uh, get involved in spying, observing, uh, listening to uh, a large number of citizens. There were some 300 different agencies this went out to, or uh, sub agencies. Uh, uh, a recent uh, check showed that there are about, uh, well, there are over 7 million uh, personality files, as they call them, over at the Pentagon. Uh, uh, significantly more, I think, 21 million index cards of some people that need to be uh, watched. Now, these are not subversives. You know, I, I'm not naive. I, I think there probably are some people in this country that would like to destroy our society and subvert it. Uh, 
foreign agents and this type of thing, but mm -hmm. there aren't very many. And this, this uh, snooping effort is directed at, uh, at the citizen who participates in a peace march, uh, who uh, perhaps would carry a picket sign in front of a supermarket, Mm -hmm. uh, the listening that's, that goes on on telephones, um, uh, the spying on people like Adlai Stevenson III, uh, Co uh, Congressman Mikva, Congressman Koch, others, pub ac actual public officials. Uh, and two people who were under yes, three years uh, old at the time. They, yes, uh, they, that, that's uh, amazing. It was in the paper yesterday. Because they had been exposed to drugs under th at, the, at the age of three and under, there were two individuals who were in the file for something that happened to them before they were three. I think one of the most alarming things about this, Dick, is that... Um, there seems to be some uh, significant uh, acceptance on the part of the average citizen. Uh, when you think of public uh, spying or listening, this is something that the average citizen thinks uh, is happening to someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, a poll taken last year by one of the major networks uh, really startled me when it showed that um, more than half of our citizens, I think it was about 56%, said they were in favor of repealing the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Well, you know, this, this is not humorous, because I wonder if there aren't a number of people that uh, sort of take for granted the, the liberties that are ours, that uh, uh, we could, uh, inch by inch, slice at a time, lose our freedoms, and end up uh, as a totalitarian state. Do you know what I would love if every American, every American, no matter poor, rich, what, could live for six months in another country, and they would know what we have here. And they do take it for granted. As it, it, it's really tough because this is the only possible country to live in. If you look at history uh, and you see how a totalitarian, <coughs> a totalitarian state uh, uh, succeeds in subverting the individual, it's not the kind of thing where you awaken in the morning and there you have a man on a white charger that's running the country. But uh, do you remember that quote that Hal Holbrook used on the closing, the first episode, his first episode in the, in the senator... Uh, on bold ones, uh, he used a quote that I like to use describing uh, what Pastor Niemiller uh, said when he was asked to describe how the Nazis took over Germany. And he said, uh, first they came after the Jews, and I was not a Jew, so I did not object. Then they came after the Catholics, and I was not a Catholic, so I did not object. Then they came after the trade unionists, and I was not a trade unionist, and I did not object. And then they came after me. And there was no one left to object. Yes. Well, I intend to object. <laughs> Artie, March 18th, very interesting is the name of a special you'll be doing on NBC. And... Uh...